Good afternoon. Is it afternoon? Yes, it is afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have been informed, and in fact, this morning I should have anticipated, and so should we all in the panel, that today will be a difficulty for the United States to be here. I should say uh, um, at once and make it quite clear that they were going to be here, and because they had even submitted the names of the delegation that would be in attendance. However, nobody could plan uh, or anticipate the date when um, um, President Bush would die. And, and um, so this happened. The state arranged the funeral for, for today. Um, um, and that was out of the delegation's purview. Uh, um, but they, 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 they cannot come today. And I understand that the civil society knows of this fact. And you, um, require, you requested for it to be moved to, to tomorrow. Um, the um, only one officer could be contacted, and um, he um, cannot answer officially at this today, because I, I, I um, conclude that he couldn't contact the others, and of course his boss. Uh, um, so we would have to. Either leave it in your um, hands to decide. Um, left to me personally, I think this is this issue is important to have had the state here to have the state present. But we are we are we are leaving it in your hands to hear what you think in the circumstances. Because I was told certain things as I came in, but that was informal. So it would be good for, for you to state formally. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, we really um, are, um, we show the utmost respect for the mourning of the passing of former President Bush. Um, we show flexibility uh -huh. to the government of the United States by proposing to uh, get together tomorrow. Uh -huh. um, we don't feel that, although they have an excuse uh, today, that the communication uh -huh. um, about it has been done in a respectful way. Uh -huh. There is no way that the United States didn't know this, at least yesterday, uh -huh. and could have informed formally our delegation about it. We are showing respect to the United States. We are proposing constructive dialogue in a very difficult situation. Precise. We are bringing people here facing deportation because of speaking up for immigrants' rights. And we don't see a respectful answer to us. We also see that it's not respectful for the commission and it shows disregard for human rights. With that said, of course, this is the very important topic. And our delegation today is, we have six human rights leaders, undocumented, that are brave enough to come here after being targeted and retaliated against. So we want to propose the commission first to ask the government to meet with us tomorrow at least with a small delegation of these people that could stay tomorrow and discuss about this topic with us. Today we are presenting two very important documents to you. Our submission, the written submission, where we are finding that there is a pattern, something that you already have been saying, a pattern of criminalizing human rights defenders and using immigration law um, in an abusive manner. Six cases we have today. They can testify today. Also, we asked the commission to write a letter to the government of the United States. In our presentation, we have questions for them because we didn't want just a simple reading of statements. We wanted to di a dialogue with the government. We want a follow-up letter where our questions are portrayed by the commission in your letter and our recommendations also 
and ask the government to provide comments on that. Along with, of course, our amazing research that we have done with the UDAP Human Rights Center about the secrecy of ICE. We are presenting today Secret Police. It's a report uh, done by the UDAP Human Rights Center and it's showing this pattern. So those two specific ask is that we are doing today. Before you finish, finish that, I think it is best since uh, Pablo is here and Alvaro is, uh, is here, that they had contact uh, and the communication with the, the you know, State Department. So perhaps they can, or the Office of the State Department, explain um, in more detail and clearer what happened. Sure. Muchas gracias, señora Presidenta. Eh, muy básicamente, debido a, a, al tema fúnebre que se declaró en el país, eh, todos las, los órganos estatales del gobierno de Estados Unidos eh, se cerraron en la fecha de hoy. Lo que ha afectado es eh, la, coincidido con nuestra fecha de, de, de realización de esta audiencia. Ayer mismo recibimos una, una llamada telefónica de parte de las autoridades del Departamento de Estado para justificar la ausencia debido a esta, a esta situación, incluso uh, pidiendo disculpas a la, a la comisión por esta, por esta ausencia, fue una, fue una llamada telefónica muy, muy gentil. Hoy por la mañana recibimos de la parte de ustedes una, un mensaje eh, planteando la posibilidad de transferir esa audiencia para mañana, y, y yo pedí entonces a, a, mi, a nuestra secretaria ejecutiva de Junta, María Claudia Pulido, para proceder eh, con, con los contactos respectivos con el Departamento de Estado para evaluar esa posibilidad. Así que quería, quería pasar la palabra a María Claudia porque los últimos contactos realizados fue ella quien, quien desarrolló. Eh, gracias. Eh, efectivamente nos comunicamos con la misión de Estados Unidos ante la Organización de Estados Americanos. Eh, eh, explicamos la solicitud eh, que desde el principio de buena fe los representantes, los solicitantes de la audiencia realizaron. Eh, les transmitimos formalmente la comunicación escrita presentada por los peticionarios eh, y hemos tenido una, una eh, noticia de parte de la misión indicando que, dado que está cerrada la, la, la oficina, eh, las oficinas federales no pudieran dar respuesta sobre la reprogramación de la audiencia hasta mañana en horas de la mañana, lo cual llevaría a que la Comisión Interamericana tomara decisión sobre eh, si se procede continuar con la audiencia en el día de hoy o si se reprograma para el día de mañana de acuerdo a la solicitud de los eh, peticionarios de la audiencia. Como es usual, la, la comisión antes de tomar cualquier decisión prefiere escuchar a, a los solicitantes, ¿no? porque podemos eh, transferirla para mañana y nosotros nos ajustaríamos para hacerlo, pero tampoco tenemos la respuesta de la parte de ellos si, si mañana podrán estar. O sea, hay un riesgo de que no puedan porque ya tienen otros compromisos, por ejemplo. Eh, y, y entonces hay un riesgo de dejarla de hacer hoy y tampoco tenerla mañana o dejarla de hacerlo hoy y tenerla mañana, pero en las mismas condiciones que estaríamos hoy. Entonces, son, es una decisión que la Comisión respeta mucho a la opinión de los solicitantes y, y queríamos escucharles. Can I just add to the Secretary's comment? Um, you mentioned that you would leave documents and that we should um, do a letter and ask questions of the states for them to answer this, these um, questions specifically. The, I see a downside in that because the, the time they would take to do that would be within their purview. Whereas if they were here, they have to answer and answer facing in you, which is the best possible way of doing it. So um, before you respond, just, just think of it and let us know. And we will, uh, um, we, will, we will just do whatever you, you, you wish. Maybe, maybe partial today and partial tomorrow. No.
the leaders have decided. They are going to do it today. But I want to do one um, more remark. I think the absence again, we, we, we were here in March 2017 with the, those empty, empty seats, are very, are very telling. And very telling or something that the US government has been saying and repeating each time they sit here, which is thematic hearings are not a mechanism that you have to assess the United States and that you should be doing uh, and putting your, um, um, your strength and your power in the assessing of uh, human rights of different other countries. We oppose that. And I think um, there's something that we should do, a civil society and you as a commission, to complain about this situation, express your concerns. It's not only that they have a really good excuse. It's an excuse that has, has a pattern, and it could have been resolved if they wanted. Yesterday, that everybody was working, they could have rescheduled it. So we take the, the, the excuse. We don't believe in it. And we ask the commission to express concern about it. We doubt thematic hearings about the United States facing the moment of criminalization of immigrants, massive incarceration of our communities, policies that you already said, and the United Nations already said, that are unlawful and arbitrary. And the US show a new law, they show uh, that they can militarize the border and tear gas children and refugees. And now they are showing that they can surveil, target, and retaliate against defenders. We want that to stop. So we are going to continue the hearing because it was a tremendous effort for the leaders to be here. Not only economical problems, it's also the risks. Also, we ask you if this presentation has any consequences on them to grant immediately precautionary measures on them. We have people that are facing um, deportation hearings really soon, and many of them in deportation proceedings. So please do that if that happens. Um, so I'm going to start to uh, continue my remarks in um, very short so they, you can, we can hear from them. Um, we are here today, um, I'm Alejandra Gonza, the director of the International Human Rights Clinic, and this is a collective effort. We are with the Youth uh, Human Rights Center. Sí. Okay. ¿Quieres decir algo de algo más? I wanted to readjust the time. Yes, thank you. <laughs> you, you now have 25 minutes and not 15, so. So, no yeah, okay. it's better, right? We always yeah. have problems with being short. Um, so, today, the University of Washington, the International Human Rights Clinic, the Center for Human Rights, uh, NYU Immigration Clinic, we are a coalition here, the, uh, the National Immigrant Rights uh, Project, um, and uh, the Northwest Re the Detention Center Resistance, all the organizations here, Migrant Justice, uh, we are here to um, denounce the, the criminalization of immigrants. Um, we will provide information <coughs> about the impact of the U.S. practice of targeting immigrants, uh, right defenders in freedom of speech, and access to information. We identified at least 17 cases that are reported. We don't know how many are unreported. Um, that show this pattern of amazing effect effective advocacy with uh, an immediate reaction from the government that conveys uh, surveillance for, uh, from ICE and the using of immigration enforcement as retaliation. We have here six examples. They are going to speak, the leaders. And also in our remarks, uh, we are going to talk about the freedom of speech and impact of targeting immigrants' rights defenders for their a a activism, the lack of judicial protection for immigration rights defenders in domestic courts, and the lack of transparency. Uh, we will close with recommendations and questions uh, that they are uh, done by the defenders. 
Um, this commission has be, been monitoring this for a long time. We feel that this is a follow-up to your press uh, release through the UN um, special procedures, um, urgent appeals, and communications to the government. And we, s we feel that since 2016, the end of 2016, the situation has worsened. Um, the new political strategy is uh, instill fear. Um, and it has had a practice of focusing on human rights defenders. And the ultimate goal is to silence them and silence the community, to make them fear and make the community fear. They want all the immigrants to be back in the shadows and fear. The mechanism is simple. The state apparatus is used to hinder human rights defenders of their freedom by putting them into bureaucratic deportation or removal proceedings. This would make them spend uh, all their time, energy, and resources in their own defenses instead of promoting, protecting, and realizing human rights on behalf of those individuals who are incarcerated. That's what they do. They go and visit them. 80% of the people in the detention centers are not represented by a lawyer. They need these advocates. This new trend under this administration has become a systematic pattern of mandatory imprisonment of human rights activists and community leaders. The main impact, of course, is the discourage. Um, but in reality, the conduct of the state is contradictory. Locally and internationally, the U.S. has been stating that they support human rights defenders. They even have a policy in the State Department, in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, uh, where they say that they support human rights defenders and they lay out a policy that they could implement to defend them, locally or internationally. This, as we are about to portray, is incompatible with international human rights standards. Um, established not only in the American Declaration of Human Rights and the Duties of Man, but in the international in instruments that the U.S. Uh, is part of. One thing that we wanted to say today, and we wanted to talk with the U.S. government, we were not facing the um, regular argument that we are trying to stretch uh, the obligations uh, that the American Declaration uh, is bringing about uh, to the U.S. We were talking about the American Declaration, the U.S. Constitution, and the Access the Freedom of Information Act in the U.S. All of that is the corpus juris that is applied today, and it's very straightforward. I'm going to give uh, the floor to Maru Mora Bisharpando um, and express all my admiration, and I thank all of you for being here and being so brave. You are our in inspiration. Thank you for being here. Good afternoon. My name is Maru Mora Villalpando. I've been a leader in the defense of immigrant rights for nearly two decades. I co-founded the Northwest Detention Center Resistance to bring light to arbitrary mass incarceration in a for-profit prison. We work for and with people that in detention in Tacoma, Washington. It is not a coincidence that I was suddenly put in deportation proceedings in 2017 after 21 years of living in the U.S. Our national and international advocacy has been effective and resulted in changes in treatment of immigrants by the United States government, states, and its cities. We have organized rallies, prompted tours of the prison, supported over a dozen of hunger strikes, visited hundreds of people detained. Here's an example. In September of 2017, our advocacy resulted in a suit by the Washington State Attorney General against GEO Group the corporation running the prison for breaking wage laws. After I testified at this commission and the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, both issued press releases, urgent appeals, and inquired about the Tacoma prison. Also in September of 2017, an ICE agent began the process of escalating retaliation by putting me into deportation. And on December of 2017, they sent me a notice to appear, starting my deportation proceedings. Nothing could have called the attention of ICE other than my activism. ICE knew that I have a U.S. citizen daughter and I could adjust soon, so why bother spending time and resources on me? All, all ICE moves are politically motivated. I had to FOIA ICE after they denied my access to files, to my files. The FOIAs were denied and I had to sue ICE. One of the forms they were hiding was the I-213 
record of the portable inadmissible alien. U.S. Senator Canwell got it, not me. I said expressly the reason for starting the process against me was my public relevance, anti-ICE activity, and Latino advocacy. ICE has shrouded themselves in secrecy and uses the legal system to hide their acts and abuse of retali and retaliation. With several redacted information we did receive, I learned about ICE surveillance and Washington Department of Licensing collaboration to deport me. ICE lied in an email writing, this individual has a final deportation order. I don't. ICE was surprised by the letter of the United Nations in February 2018 uh, asking about my case. To respond to the UN, ICE started investigating if I had a visa application. It is a political witch hunt in the form of immigration enforcement. There is no real legal avenue to fight. It is not a fair fight. My life has changed. My community is in fear. Many went back to the shadows. My case detracts me from defending immigrants in detention who now fear of retaliation for speaking out. For hunger strikers, not having access to our support is truly a matter of life and death, as recently shown by the death of asylum seeker and hunger striker Amar Merganzana that drew national and international headlines. People died. My recommendations to the government, or I should say my demands to the government, My demands to the government are, one, respond and disclose if there are any operations, policies, or practices allowing immigrants to be targeted with law enforcement actions based on media appearances, activism, or criticism. Two, demand eyes, release all the records we demanded. Shouldn't be, we shouldn't be submitting FOIAs to ICE to get information. ICE must disclose all documents relating to surveillance, monitoring, arrests without any reductions. It's time to stop ICE secrecy and retaliation. And last, stop my deportation proceedings along with all the other activists like me. Thank you. Hello, my name is Shakori Tankara. I'm a US citizen. My husband, Sajjad Tankara, and I spoke out about medical neglect of himself and others detained in Tacoma. Because of that, we got the worst retaliation possible family separation and inhumane deportation. Saja lived 18 plus years in the US and was deported after spending nine and a half months in detention. He was deported to Sierra Leone, a country he doesn't know because he grew up in the Gambia. It was a battle to keep him alive while in detention. I fear his deportation will lead to his death. Before being detained, Saja had a tumor on his neck and was scheduled for surgery, but ICE refused to let him have it till three months later. I was not notified about it. The detention center denied information for two days. I should have been with my husband during his surgery. After surgery, his health continued to decline. He constantly suffered from excruciating pain and often had been taken to the emergency room. He was diagnosed with asthma, hypertension, and was going blind, which he didn't have before he was detained. He said to me, I don't want to die in here. I contacted the state and city health departments to complain about the neglect of my husband's health and to report general health conditions in detention. They did not help us, so we went public. He and I spoke to Seattle Weekly about the detention center's lack of adic adequate medical care for him and others in detention. After the article was released, everything changed. The next day I received a call from Sajjad telling me that he would be deported. I followed up with ICE, but they said that they had no paperwork to deport him. Fearing the worst, we organized call to actions, rallies, and started a petition for him to be released on medical grounds. Our efforts did not succeed. Sajjad was deported abruptly to Sierra Leone two and a half weeks after the Seattle Weekly article. Sajjad had to beg ICE to notify me of his deportation. ICE did not allow me or my children to say goodbye. No kiss, no hug, no conversation. Saja left to Sierra Leone humiliated, embarrassed, and with a life-threatening condition that requires constant medical supervision. 
He currently has no medication and continues to suffer from excruciating pain. Life without Saja has been hard for me and my two children who have been diagnosed with PTSD. He tells me that he wants to see us before he dies and that I should tell his story because it could be someone else's husband, father, or son. Being released from detention and staying in this country was a matter of life and death for him. With the I-130 pending, I will continue fighting so he can come back to receive the medical help he needs before it's too late. My recommendations for the government is to conduct a investigation on my husband's unfair deportation and also create a system for those suffering from serious illnesses to be released and allowed to fight for their lives and their cases outside detention. Thank you. Hola a todos, eh, yo voy a hablar en español. Eh, mi nombre es Enrique Balcázar Sánchez, pertenezco a la organización Justicia Migrante. Eh, trabajé en la industria lechera desde que llegué al estado de Vermont y soy portavoz de más de 1,500 trabajadores lecheros y soy uno de los arquitectos de Leche con Dignidad, un programa que asegura los derechos humanos en los ranchos lecheros. Voy a hablar de cómo la migra nos vigiló y nos persiguió por defender y abogar por los derechos de los trabajadores lecheros en Vermont, quienes sostenemos esa industria tan importante para el Estado. Ya como vocero, promovimos varias iniciativas que, pro, que provocaron que nos quis, quisieran silenciar. En, pri, en primer lugar, iniciamos una campaña para tener licencias de conducir y logramos que, logramos que la legislatura del Estado aprobara una ley para garantizar el derecho a una licencia de conducir sin importar el estatus migratorio. En segundo lugar, lugar logramos pasar ordenanzas que evitan la colaboración entre policías y agentes de inmigración, rechazando la crimin, crimin, criminalización de las personas indocumentadas y limitando el intercambio de información privada entre el personal del Departamento de Motores y Vehículos y ICE. Como parte de eso, fui nombrado como representante de mi comunidad en un comité formado por el Fiscal General de Vermont para aconsejar al gobierno estatal sobre asuntos de inmigración. Por, eso hemos, hemos, por esto hemos incomodado a la administración. Ejercer la libertad de expresión nos ha traído consecuencias muy graves. Los miembros de nuestra organización se han convertido en el blanco de ICE. Múltiples miembros han sido detenidos como represalia por activismo. Uno de los tantos compañeros que fue detenido por ICE fue interrogado acerca de mí y si me conocía. El oficial ex expresamente le dijo, Quique es el siguiente. ICE vigila nuestras casas, nuestros correos electrónicos, redes sociales, obtienen información privada sobre nosotros e inclusive han reclutado por lo menos una persona que se ha infiltrado a nuestra organización para obtener información confidencial sobre nuestras actividades y nuestra membresía. El 17 de marzo del 2017 fui arrestado y detenido por cuatro, cuatro agentes encubiertos de ICE. Estuve 11 días detenido e inició el proceso de deportación. Esto no es justo. Hemos luchado por mejores condiciones de trabajo y que se respeten nuestros derechos fundamentales como seres humanos. Ser objetivo de ICE ha traído consecuencias graves no solo a mí, sino a la comunidad que represento y a mi organización, Justicia Migrante. Mis recomendaciones al Estado, al Estado es transparentar las políticas de vigilancia de ICE y establecer mecanismos de responsabilidad por, abu por, abu por, abuso, por el uso abusivo de poder. Gracias. Hello, my name is Alejandra Pablos. My pronouns are she and they. I am a reproductive and immigrants' rights advocate targeted in a protest, and I'm affected by the everyone is deportable policy. 
I've lived in the U.S. my whole life, alongside the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health, the Detention Watch Network, the National Network of Abortion Funds, and Mi Gente, I defend the Latinx community. As a young person, like most people growing up, I had some bumps on the road and served some time behind bars for nonviolent charges. But I lived in Arizona, a state known worldwide for its anti-immigration, anti-immigrant policies. I was picked up by ICE while I was following the conditions of my probation and spent two years detained at Eloy Detention Center, a private immigration civil prison. Um, I was fighting there to remain here, all legitimate claims. During that time, I lost my permanent resident card and I was placed in deportation proceedings. At that immigration prison, I experienced and witnessed the inhumane conditions under which detainees are forced to live under. Abuses and human rights violations are a daily occurrence inside. Having these experiences changed my life. It awakened me. While I was detained, I fought for fundamental rights and dignity for ourselves. I organized community conversations, taught English classes, and joined advocates that were fighting against the inhumane conditions and state violence while inside. I truly believe that this country gave the protection of the First Amendment, my right to freedom of speech and to assemble. After surviving immigration detention in 2013 for two years, I continued to focus on fighting for social justice, organized marches, community uh, meetings, etc. Speaking up is what caused me to be re-detained. On January 2018, I attended a rally in Virginia where we were peacefully protesting the Department of Homeland Security and its agents for targeting our community with violent tactics. I was leading chants. I wasn't even the leader at that demonstration. Nonetheless, I was singled out and detained by the police, by DHS police, and I was the only one arrested. When I asked the officer why he arrested me, he told me, you were the loudest, and he knew arresting me would end the protest. It was clear that I was targeted. I was released, but the incident was flagged to ICE, and then I was taken into custody at my next check-in. I've been checking in and going to courts for almost five years at this point. I spent more than 30, 43 days inside those cold walls again, even though those, even though those charges were dropped. There are risks for me even coming here to speak to you today as a human rights defender. The retaliation from the government showed against me has had a chilling effect on all our community, our members, and our activists, and the activities that promote human rights. This administration forces me to escalate my advocacy. The violations right now are so critical that there's no other choice. I don't know other ways than to defend what I believe is fair and right and just. So I come here today um, with my recommendations and demands um, one, to stop silencing dissent. Two, support rights of migrants and in search of safety. And also my political asylum claim, because I fear being deported to a country where my family doesn't reside in, uh, or where a country where my abortion, my reproductive rights work, and my political views will put me in danger. Three, support um, my request to have the governor of Arizona grant a pardon in my, re in my case so I can stay here with my country. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Janae Cawthon. I'm Jean Montreville's ex-wife, who was a, Jean is a high profile immigrant rights activist in New York. Jean was deported back to Haiti, a country where he has not lived in for more than 30 years. I believe the father of my three children was targeted by ICE because of his fierce activism. We were one of the founders of the New Sanctuary Movement and we also members of Families for Freedom, which is an immigrant rights organization. Since Trump became president, he has put all non-citizens at risk for deportation. At the age of 50, Gene never gave up fighting with his inhumane de deportation order that was issued when he was serving time for a drug conviction when he was a teenager. The law that they used to order him deported was implemented after his conviction and should not have applied to him. It's very sad immigration laws run retroactively. Gene still craved for social justice and publicly spoke about imperfections of ICE. He had big hopes that his pending legal case would have been successful and would have enabled him to live the American dream of raising his children, especially since he lost his mom at the age of nine and his dad died while he was incarcerated. <coughs> he never wanted to be separated from his family. 
I come to you as a fierce immigrant rights activist who will continue to speak out against injustices of non-citizens in the U.S. On January 3rd of this year, Gene was arrested by ICE while on his way to work. He was being surveilled by ICE for weeks without his knowledge. Fortunately, he still had his cell phone and was able to text me, and I immediately notified his lawyer. But when his lawyer arrived at 26 Federal Plaza, ICE denied any knowledge of Gene's arrest. I was devastated. I became a single parent overnight, and my children <clears throat> and my children became fatherless as a, re a result of him being deported for a 30 year old drug conviction. His children are left in the US without their dad. Our son, who was accepted to Brooklyn Tech High School, which is one of the top high schools in the world, grades went from A's to D's and F's. Our son, <coughs> is now diagnosed with depression and has been placed on medication. Our oldest daughter is a junior in college and up until her dad's detainment, she was able to live a normal teenage life and live on a college campus. She was forced to move back home because Jean is not here to help provide for her college expenses. Our youngest daughter, who's 11, is in mental health therapy and has been diagnosed with a separation disorder. My questions for the government, if they would have showed up, is I would like them to explain what are ICE limits to surveil and investigate people and how we can pursue accountability of the officials exceeding their power. And I also want to know what and why is ICE hiding? Why can't we access information that belongs to us and the public? My third question is, why doesn't DHS provide child support to children whose parents have been detained and or deported against their will? Thank you. Sorry. Okay, I will speak fast. Uh, my name is Ravida Ragbir. I'm the uh, human rights defender and the executive director of the New Century Coalition, which you just heard Janae speak about Jean as one of the co-founders of that organization. On January 11th, um, ICE arrested, uh, arrested me at an annual one of my annual supervision um, at the federal office in New York. Um, they immediately transferred me to Chrome facilities in, in Florida. But during the arrest, the violence that, this, that, they, that they used to get take, to take me away um, was so intense that a, a number of people were arrested and a few people were injured during this process. Um, before that, um, you heard that Jean was surveilled. Well, when my attorneys were reached out to, um, to ICE, uh, this, this, she, my attorney who is right here, who was speaking to the deputy director of ICE, um, I said he knew exactly the hat I wear, how I walked. Um, they actually said I'd be bopped down the road. Because, so which means they knew the street, the home, the, the door numbers, everything about me. So they have been surveilling me uh, at length. Um, the, 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 um, in, the reason why they, they were targeting me is because of our, one of our programs, the accompaniment program, where we literally take citizens into immigration offices um, to, to witness what is happening and hold them accountable for treating people with respect so, so that they actually are um, uh, forced to not take people away and detain them or deport them. Um, that has caused being a, a considerable thorn in their side and they wanted to, to take me away so that it will disrupt that program. In fact, um, we, had, we would take we, the accompaniment we are taking elected officials into the, to, to see what is happening. And I, um, when they were talking to my attorneys, said that they, they were not going to allow any of that to happen again because those elected officials were literally saying we need to abolish ICE because of the humanity of the process. My wife has been suffering post um, uh, depression, and I did not know how it affected me until um, 
uh, until recently when the courts stayed my removal pending a decision from them. And since January 11, the first time I traveled was um, on Monday, um, November 28th, I think. I, don't, I, um, I was going to San Diego. And as I was stepping into the plane, there was a lot of anxiety that I did not know I, I, that, was, that, that I lived through. Um, so ICE is a, a rogue agency, um, but my lawyers don't want me to say that right now. So I'm just going to talk about my demands, which is um, that we need to put in place, a, 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 to, we need to put a system in place to deal with unfair deportation and the impact this has this policy is having on children and families who have been left behind. Because right now we are creating, because of the millions of families who have been affected, we are creating a, a future public health crisis of children who are depressed and who are, not going, who are not functional because they have not been able to learn because of the separation of their families. Thank you. My name is Emily Willard. Yes, uh, we, we're going to give you more time, but be, be as quick as you possibly can, because this is a very emotive and very serious matter. So, Thank you, Madam President. We will have two more remarks. Mm -hmm. One will be Emily from the UDAP Human Rights Center mm -hmm. about the secret police report, mm -hmm. and then uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, Catalina will be closing. Okay. My name is Emily Willard. Um, I'm representing the U University of Washington Center for Human Rights. Um, and today we released a report and shared with you a copy called the Secret Police Access to Information about Immigration Enforcement in the United States. Um, and it's a report about our general experiences um, trying to get more um, U.S. government information about all of the cases that people shared um, with you today. Um, we use the Freedom of Information Act, which is a federal U.S. government law, which gives us the right as the public in the United States to request government information as a tool to hold the U.S. government accountable. Every, every time we try to use this law, we face um, immense challenges. So. When we request information, um, they either don't respond to us at all, which is a violation of the law. When they respond to us, sometimes they give us incorrect information, um, which we're able to verify through um, requests that we send to, through the Washington State Public Record. So for example, we're able to match emails between um, Washington State agencies and the federal government. The federal government says they don't have the information, but we know because of the state records. Um, additionally, um, when they, um, they also, the, how they set up relationships with other agencies. Um, so for example, using private corporations um, to do uh, enforcement, um, especially around the Northwest Detention Center and in other places. Um, because that's a private corporation, the FOIA has limited access, so they're strategically using private corporations to withhold and keep information secret. Um, I'll leave it at that. Um, those are our main points. Um, I would say as a recommendation is that um, we say that immigration court records should be a public record the way that criminal court um, records are, that the government um, funding for Department of Homeland Security should be directly linked to their compliance with the Freedom of Information Act, um, and that private corporations under contract with the federal government should have to release and, and um, comply with FOIA for those activities that are contracted by the federal government. Thank you. Madam President and distinguished commission members, Today you have heard, heard firsthand from the people targeted and who suffer the effects of the U.S. practice of surveilling and deporting human rights defenders because of their opinions and their advocacy. Through their own words, we learn that targeting immigrant rights defenders for their activism hurts their freedom of speech. The threats of deportation are grave for the leaders themselves their work is obstructed in their communities, work that sometimes means life and death to the people that receive those services. Immigrant leaders um, 
targeting them creates a chilling effect for immigrant leaders, their families, the undocumented community. We also want to mention that through these statements, you can see a, a lack of judicial protection for immigrant rights defenders in domestic court and, and their families. Immigrants facing deportation, even long-time residents without lawful status, are not provided with the right to counsel in deportation cases because they're not criminal offenses. Immigration courts, which are administrative, not judicial tribunals, do not generally recognize or adjudicate constitutional claims arising under the First Amendment. This means that immigrants face specific and additional hurdles to adjudicate their First Amendment claims in court. The Supreme Court has established precedent that has made raising these claims more difficult. Adding to this is a lack of transparency and a lack of consideration for the impact that gathering in this information through the use of immigration enforcement officers has on the community and on the people. This is a dangerous trend that the United States government has engaged in. And it is dangerous that they consider themselves exempt from disclosure altogether. The recommendations that the speakers made today do not create additional obligations for the government. We want to make that clear. We simply ask the government to abide by cur current freedom of speech and human rights standards that are not lost and not dependent on nationality or immigration status. The United States has these this obligations as they are parties to several international treatments that protect human rights and freedom of speech. Lastly, we ask this, the US government to stop the surveillance targeting and deportation tactics aimed at silencing immigrant human rights defenders and their communities. We are very happy to provide more details or information to the commissioners um, if there is any questions regarding what we have spoken about today. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, though I'm the country rapporteur for the United States, I have a practice wherein I ask the others to intervene before I intervene at the end. So I'm going to invite first Vice President of, um, Esmeralda, my sister commissioner, to intervene. Muchas gracias, señora Presidenta. Eh, sí, luego de, de escuchar esta, estos testimonios, le eh, queda claro a la Comisión, como sucede en otros países, la necesidad de la protección de los derechos de los defensores de derechos, ¿sí? la protección de quienes asumen la defensa de los derechos de eh, las otras personas. Eh, quisiera hacer una precisión o, que, o tener de parte de ustedes una precisión. Eh, acaba de señalar la, la última participante, dice, eh, la petición que, que se le hace a, a, al gobierno, al Estado, eh, no es nada extraordinario, es el cumplimiento de las leyes. Con respecto a esta... A esta está apuntalado, la dirección de aplicación de las leyes de inmigración y aduanas, ICE, en, en español ICE, eh, tiene una, una normativa eh, específica en la que eh, está la obligatoriedad eh, de el respeto de los derechos humanos de las personas que es, pueden estar en este estatus de, de, de inmigración, el tema de, de su, su situación migratoria. ¿Ustedes estiman que esa, eh, esa legislación es, es eh, completa? ¿No habría que, que hacer una revisión de esa normativa 
para identificar eh, cuáles son las normas con las que se sustenta, no sé si, si me explico, las normas que, que, que sustentan las actuaciones de los funcionarios responsables de atender esta, esta, esta situación. Porque eh, el, la sola negación de la información eh, representa, eh, que, quiero saber si representa una violación a esa ley que regula eh, a la, al, al organismo este ICE, o ICE, no sé, ICE. <ríe> eh, yo lo digo en, el, en la lectura en español. Eh, entonces, porque, porque eh, si tenemos estos, el, los instrumentos legales para eh, demandar la, eh, la actuación ilegítima, ilegal de estos funcionarios, ¿hay procesos en, esa, en ese sentido? ¿Ustedes han eh, activado? Eh, ¿Se cumple o no se cumple eh, las disposiciones legales que esos funcionarios expresamente están obligados a responder? Ustedes señalan, se van por la vía de la otra normativa en, en el derecho a la información para que eh, la, esta unidad responda a la petición de información. Un poco esa, ese sentido del de cumplimiento de la ley por parte de este organismo y los mecanismos que tendrían para demandar las actuaciones ilegales de esos funcionarios. Gracias. Thank you, Esmeralda. I now invite um, my brother, Commissioner, Second Vice President Ernesto Vergas, to intervene. Gracias. Oh, the Rapporteur of Migrants. The right. Yes. Sí, exactamente. Soy el relator temático en tema de migraciones. Y pues, la verdad que duele muchísimo escuchar de manera tan cercana las, el testimonio que ustedes han vertido hoy como víctimas. Yo creo que estamos pasando el peor momento histórico que puede existir con relación a los derechos de los migrantes. Y si a esto ahora se suma la persecución a los defensores de derechos humanos de las personas en estado de movilidad, pues todavía empeora más la situación. En un momento en que justamente el tema de movilidad se está presentando en más países, ya no solamente es el ingreso eh, del Triángulo Norte para llegar a la frontera con Estados Unidos, sino que ahora se han desatado verdaderos exos en la región y con las consecuencias graves que tiene que desde el norte se estén implantando políticas eh, a través de las cuales se ven cada día más exacerbados los discursos de odio contra los migrantes, contra los defensores de derechos humanos. Uno pensaría en un principio que es un problema de aporofobia en los términos de, de Adela Cortina, eh, a través del cual eh, pues simple y llanamente se permite el acceso de personas siempre y cuando vayan a llevar dinero al determinado país, pero las personas que son repelidas es más por su condición, econo por condición económica que por otra cosa. Pero eh, se han estado incrementando más y más discriminaciones que ya uno no sabe realmente cuál es eh, esa tendencia para y llevar a las personas a odiar a sus congéneres por el solo hecho de querer ingresar, de movilizarse hacia un determinado territorio. Eh, yo quisiera que ustedes nos contaran cuál ha sido el papel de los tribunales, de los jueces, que por fortuna, como di dirían eh, hace dos o tres siglos, todavía hay jueces en Berlín, todavía hay jueces que hacen respetar la Constitución y las leyes, pero ¿cuál ha sido esencialmente el papel de los jueces y de los tribunales con relación a la protección de los derechos de los migrantes, sobre todo en esta época en los cuales se dan casos tan inhumanos como la separación de los niños hacia sus familias? Segundo, ¿cuál ha sido el papel de los medios de comunicación en las denuncias sobre estas medidas discriminatorias 
y repito, tan inhumanas como las que se han estado presentando. Y tercero, si el tema de movilidad social o de movilidad a través de, lo, de las medios de comunicación ha servido realmente para denunciar a cabalidad estas prácticas eh, que engendran una situación eh, tan odiosa, tan discriminatoria hacia los derechos de los migrantes. A ver si ustedes nos cuentan eh, si eso realmente ha servido, si hay que seguir impulsando esta clase de medidas tanto a nivel judicial como a nivel de medios de comunicación, como a nivel de, de utilizar las redes sociales para hacer las denuncias correspondientes eh, acerca de esta clase de, de discriminaciones. Y finalmente, si ustedes tienen el, eh, la… si nos podrían informar, informar cuántos son los defensores de los derechos de los migrantes que han sido eh, detenidos o que han sido deportados a a los países de origen. Sí. To address these questions, the first thing that I will go with, oh, oh, you have, oh, sorry. Well, Maria Claudia will now um, intervene the um, Assistant Executive Secretary. Eh, gracias, Presidenta. Eh, Realmente una audiencia que eh, desde la perspectiva técnica um, y también humana es, es, afecta profundamente por las vivencias que nos presentan y los retos que depositan en la eh, Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos. Uh, nosotros eh, hemos estado siguiendo con detalle eh, la situación que se ha venido presentando eh, y la comisión ha venido emitiendo diferentes eh, comunicados de prensa, ha emitido cartas, artículo 41, solicitando información. Y realmente en este caso específico, ustedes han hecho muchos llamados, digamos, al Estado, eh, de, a, a los Estados Unidos de América sobre medidas concretas. Mi pregunta sería directamente sobre qué medidas consideran que debe, pudiera adoptar la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos para atender esta situación teniendo eh, claro cuáles son los mecanismos con lo que, los que ella cuenta. Muchísimas gracias. I, I now invite um, Al Alvaro uh, Botero, who is, um, heads the technical um, arm of the commission in relation to migrants, refugees, um, asylum seekers, stateless persons, and other areas. Thank you. Muchas gracias, comisionada. Muchas gracias, comisionados. Eh, y principalmente a las organizaciones de la sociedad civil y a las defensoras y defensores eh, de personas migrantes que están presentes en esta audiencia y sobre todo por sus invaluables testimonios y, y por todo lo que han tenido que, que atravesar. Eh, yo creo que muchas de las preguntas que, que podríamos tener con relación a esto eh, ya fueron abordadas por, por las y los comisionados. Eh, en particular desde, desde el enfoque de, de los especialistas técnicos que apoyan a la comisión. Eh, creo que temas bastante importantes que, de los cuales requeriríamos mayor información o tener mayor conocimiento tiene que ver de nuevo con el rol o la importancia que pueden jugar las uh, autoridades judiciales o los jueces en la protección de los defensores de migrantes que están siendo víctimas de... Eh, persecución eh, por eh, actuaciones de agentes públicos, eh, si han habido algunas medidas en ese sentido y si eh, a agentes responsables de este tipo de conductas han sido responsabilizados por este tipo de, de comportamientos. Eh, luego, otro tema que es bastante importante y, y que se ha desarrollado en muchos países de la región, pero quizás no tanto en los Estados Unidos, tiene que ver con mecanismos de protección eh, para el rol de defensoras y defensores de derechos humanos, sobre todo eh, en tiempos donde estamos viendo que la defensa de los derechos humanos se está volviendo una cuestión cada vez más cuestionada eh, y cada vez más en contra de las acciones que, que se vienen desarrollando en diferentes estados. Eh, y por último, en un contexto donde cada vez vemos un mayor auge de políticas de criminalización, de estigmatización contra migrantes y contra ahora también los defensores y defensoras de derechos humanos de, de las personas migrantes, 
si ha habido por parte de autoridades federales o a nivel estatal algún tipo de reconocimiento sobre la importancia del rol que desempeñan los defensores de derechos humanos de los migrantes y sobre cómo, a partir de la importancia que, que tiene el rol de estas personas, precisamente una premisa básica que deben hacer los agentes estatales es no promover la persecución de aquellas personas que defienden los derechos humanos de otras. Eh, esas serían todas mis preguntas. Gracias. Now, if I may, uh, I, I really have to sigh um, because uh, this is, it boggles the mind that the United States of America, which used to be described as the cradle of the world, is acting in this way. This country and the government, I should say, not the country, because the indigenous people were here. It was their country. Um, this, the, the administration of the United States of America is made up by descendants of migrants. How can you act in such an in, inhumane way? In fact, lots of what I'm hearing are really, to my mind, fall within the category of crimes against humanity because the numbers are so large and getting larger by the day. And one thing that, 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 that bothers me is that when hearing, hearing what you say, <coughs> when the ICE acts against a uh, rights defender in this kind of instance, and in fact the authorities act against any human rights defenders, they also are acted against the family members and too often destroy the family. This is a country that predicates to believe in the family. And yet, we have the, the history of the separation of, of children from their parents. And their untold numbers of them uh, still have not been re reunited with their, their, their parents. How can this be? And how can we have the highest official of the state speak so highly of ICE when we hear what they get up to, the impunity with which they act? Because there are laws in this country. We've heard of a uh, few judgments of the federal courts which have decided against the government. And what happens? The president castigates the judges and abuses them and attacks their, their sense of, of, of nationality and pa patriotism. And in fact, their oath to do justice. How can that be? How can that be? So we have asked to go to detention centers in the border um, that is Esmeralda, my, um, Lu uh, Luis Vargas, and myself. And we have had a, 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 a positive response to it, um, that we would, could go at the last week in January. We, we are fixing the details with the State Department, and we hope that we do get to go, um, because it is the only way that we can, because we have to give a balance to both sides, your side and the state, which is un unfortunately absent at the moment, but understandably today. Um, and after that, after that, we will make our assessment uh, um, about the sentence. But I, I, I have to ask you, Alejandro, do you live in a sanctuary state? And yet, you have this detention Tacoma there. I, 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 I can't, I, it blows my mind, the contradictions, you know. Wow. And really, I would like some help as to how I, I could advance my rapporteurship and my mandate. I really need the help from you guys. Yeah? So. Um, go to it. Um, let me let me see. Let me see. Where is the time sheet? I, I just have yeah, to yeah, check yeah, yeah. a time. Um, oh five yes, we we run out of time. But please, uh, if you can address us for um, five minutes. Yeah. No, you want? Yeah.
five minutes you want to speak? No, five minutes, please. And then you must send us stuff. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And we are going to address in written uh, several um, uh, answers to your questions. We need your help, too. Um, come to the detention center in Tacoma. We are going to go with you. You are going to witness what we are telling and the pictures. It's worse than what we've seen. And we want that promise to, to concrete, right? Uh, come with us, visit the detention center in, in Tacoma. Um, I want to make a clarification. We didn't want to say that we are not uh, asking the U.S. government more than what is already is in the law. Uh, we were just saying that we are not asking more of international human rights obligations than what is already in the American Declaration. But we are here because we want to abolish ICE. We want this to change. And for that, we have to dismantle the enforcement uh, operation system that is creating a massive human rights violations in this country. Uh, I'm going to give the, the, the floor to, um, um, to Paramita Shah from the National um, uh, Immigration Project of the National Immigration mm -hmm. Lawyers yeah. Guild. It's hard to say the whole name. Uh, to answer some of the questions regarding what is the role of um, domestic courts uh, and all of that. But w the help that we need the, the commission to address also, um, Maria Claudia Pulido, is continue doing the monitoring, more press releases that are uh, fast um, and on time when the things are happening. Uh, even joint press releases with the United Nations is extremely helpful. They have an impact. They bother us. Uh, they, they, they said that we got a FOIA and we got a letter from the United Nations asking for information and they didn't know what to do about it. They wanted to respond and they didn't know what to do about it. So that helps convey follow-up meetings so we can sit uh, with the government and to the Rapporteur of Freedom of Speech include in, in this annual report what we are saying about FOIA because always the United States is portrayed as the perfect country of Freedom of Information Act and we want to show that that is not true and we have a great report to do that. Um, I will give you the floor, Paramita, if you can address that and maybe then Maru. Um, Madam President and distinguished commissioners, um, thank you for uh, having us here today. I'm actually here um, as a representative of uh, the National Immigration Project, which is representing Maru in her uh, case, in her Freedom of Information Act litigation case, and also in another case against uh, the federal government asking for them to enjoin the government from retaliating against immigrant rights mm -hmm. activists. And I'm also here with other lawyers who are here from Migrant Justice and also from the New York University School of Law who are here with other members um, who have also filed lawsuits. And so I'm going to do a very short uh, answer to your question, which is, um, yes, uh, there are remedies to file lawsuits. These remedies are insufficient. Um, they, we have engaged and will engage in protracted litigation. The information that we get, the pages of information, the discovery um, that we embark upon is often limited. Um, it is a struggle to obtain documents that are not redacted. It is a struggle to obtain sometimes any documents at all. Um, and the kinds of uh, discussions that we engage with the Department of Justice or the Department of Homeland Security to get in, just to get the basic information as to what is happening to our clients is very difficult. Um, compounding this problem um, is that uh, is a structural problem that immigrants do not get counsel in immigration proceedings. So even though there is federal litigation that is moving, there's also an immigration, separate immigration case that is moving. And many of these activists face the risk of deportation before their case will ever be concluded. And so um, I think the risk is dire uh, to activists uh, who are not uh, able to kind of align these two separate processes quickly. Um, and I'm happy to speak to you uh, more, but that um, it has been, you know, in the, in the last year, I think there have been four or five lawsuits that have been filed um, on behalf of these individuals, um, either for information gathering or to stop the deportations themselves. 
Um, but I think where we are is that uh, the courts, especially with the government's interest in installing uh, new judges um, who are not uh, committed to some of the of the um, ideals that kind of guide and gird um, our our immigration constitution, our Im American constitution, um, that I think in the future will continue to pose a problem. Can I make uh, one quick comment? I, I have to go. Um, the, when you look at the, it's not only about the act, uh, targeting of activists, but the targeting of the policy that was, is already terrible, but has actually been now monitored to, and adjusted to make it more difficult for people to get benefits. So what you have, for instance, is the Attorney General um, taking cases in and changing the rules that have been set by the courts so that people who have domestic violence claims are not uh, eligible for it anymore. So there are a number of cases like that and, and, and parameters and the rest of them can, so it, it is a larger cause, um, institutional problem that has to be addressed. Thank you very much, I have to go. Just to finalize, I you know we ran out of time, but I wanted to address the, the questions about um, the usage of uh, media. And that's, that's one of the biggest, uh, it's our only tool sometimes as organizers, but it's also the, the biggest tool that the, the government uses against us. And so for us, whatever um, communiques could come from your commission are extremely, extremely helpful, um, not only for our individual cases, but also for our larger um, education campaigns that we do, where we wanna make sure that people understand that the US should be held accountable at an international level. Um. Thank you very, very much. And um, it would have been even better if, had the state been here. But um, you have it on record, uh, um, the testimonies you've given, and I thank all of you for your courage and your stalwartness in coming to speak with us about what has happened to your significant others, your uh, husbands, your f and, and the effect on your families, because that's very, very important. And <coughs> also um, the, the, the fact that the courts are not, in fact, especially the, the um, state domestic courts are not acting in the way that one would expect um, um, courts with the kind of constitution which exists in this country to act. Um, um, and as I said, there are a few federal decisions which have been publicized and, and which n generally gives one hope, but not enough. Uh, um, so we will continue to, to follow up and, and monitor, and we um, will, in fact, be in contact with the, the, the U.S. and do send us what you wish um, um, us to pass over to them uh, um, in the form of your questions and, and ask for their response. Um, because this is an issue which is not going to go away and which is pub public and in certainly getting worse rather than better. So we must do what we can under our mandate. Thank you very much for coming and, and uh, again, and it's good to see you again, <laughs> Alexander. And I will try, uh, try to come to Tacoma as I promised. Yeah. <laughs> but you we know. We will take you. Yeah, okay. We will request okay. a special tour. Okay. We can do it. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Thank you uh, members of the audience who are here. Um, and if you have any information, please submit it to the commission. We we'll need information from anyone who has cogent information to give us to act. And thank you to the interpreters for assisting us to our follow the proceedings and the technicians as well. Thank, Thank you. you. This hearing is at an end. <laughs> <laughs>